Well, good morning, Mossbrook. This has been an awesome adventure this summer, being out here. Every single 18 weeks, we've had beautiful weather. Um, and it might rain in the afternoon, but it's always sunny uh, while we're here. And I'm just really grateful. This is going to be the last time we get to meet here at the fairgrounds. Uh, it's, so let's just let's enjoy it. Let's stand up. Let's sing together. Let's just have a really, really great time worshiping the Lord this morning. Unstoppable God.
Thank you, folks. You can be seated. Glad to see everybody here this morning. How many people are glad that they didn't let the frost on the windshield discourage them this morning? All right. Well, I just want you to know how fortunate you guys are because it's about 20 degrees colder right here than it is where you guys are sitting right now. So I'm happy for you that you're in the sunshine, and I'm glad you're here this morning. Going to let the kids be dismissed to their uh, groups if you want. Just head on over here to your right, my left, and uh, the folks are there to go with them to their groups for the next few minutes. I have a few things that I want to mention to you this morning. Melody and I were talking about it the other day, and we said this is the, the vortex in September of all the announcements because of all the things that are going on. But we want you guys to be informed uh, about what is happening. Tomorrow night, our equip classes begin for the fall. So tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, uh, Dave Lambertson will be teaching Reasons to Believe at the admin building, the church office at 496 High Street. That's going to be a great class. I'm planning to attend it myself. I think it's going to be really helpful. If you are questioning your faith or if you have people in your life who are questioning faith and what it means to believe in Jesus, Dave is going to help us to see how we can know for sure that Jesus is who he says that he is, that he did rise from the grave, that he did live and die for us uh, to provide our salvation. That's going to be a great class, and I hope you take advantage of it tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Then on Tuesday night at 6, I will be teaching a class called Four Tough Questions, and we're going to look at some difficult areas of life and practice that we face in our world today. We're going to examine those in light of the Scripture. So I hope you take advantage of those. If you have a small group that meets on one of those nights and you would like your group to be a part of that, then please feel free to come. We've got plenty of space in the building there and would love to have you to be a part of that. Also, when you came in this morning, either when you were driving or when you were sitting or from last week, hopefully everybody has one of these. This is our partnership covenant for 2020-21, and uh, we'll be talking about that more in just a bit. But if you are a part of Mossbrook Church and you would like to be connected and uh, you would like to commit with us together as a church to attend church, to give, to serve, and to help us reach our community, then we're going to give you an opportunity to sign that in just a few minutes and bring it up and put it in the basket on the table. Also, if you don't want to do that, if you're in your cars, you don't want to get out, uh, the Partnership Covenant is also available on the app and on the website as well. You can fill it out there and submit it, and we'll, we'll make sure and have it that way. I don't know how many people are keeping track of this. I know I keep reminding you, so maybe some of you are aware, but this is 18 Sundays in a row with no rain here at the Oxford County Fairgrounds for Mossbrook Church. And um, we thought we'd do something fun here in the next week or so. We thought that we would just radically reimagine how we do church again for the fourth time in the last six months. So we had eight weeks of video church in March and April and into May. Then we had five weeks of drive-in church over there. And now we've had 13 weeks of camp chair church. And next Sunday we thought we'd try, are you ready for it? Greenhouse church. How's that sound, everybody? Uh, we, uh, uh, obviously not very good because only 12 people are clapping. Well, there's going to be plenty of room. Uh, here's the thing, guys. We just, we cannot go back to the high school with things the way that they are. They've reset the entire building in order to accommodate some of their guidelines and restrictions. And uh, it would not be fair to us to try and bully our way in there. We're not going to do that. We value our relationship with the school board and the community. And uh, we don't want to make their job any more difficult than it already is. And so we are going to move up to the Young's Farm at 649 High Street in South Paris. And right along the road, parallel to the road, there is a huge cold frame greenhouse. And that is going to be the site of Mossbrook Church for... I have absolutely no idea. But starting next week, that I do know. Uh, so we would love to have you join us there. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. We're going to ask you to bring your camp chairs like you're doing now. We're going to be spending some time up there this week getting it cleaned out and getting it set up. We're going to put some panels up so that everybody will be able to see what's going on. 
And here's the thing, guys. That building is 30 feet wide and is 300 feet long. So there's 9,000 square feet of space in that building. If we had, I don't anticipate that we will, but if we had 300 people, each one of them could have 30 square feet to themselves. So there's plenty of room to social distance. I anticipate it'll be more like this. We'll have 100 or 150, but whatever it is, there's plenty of room to spread out. As we move into that greenhouse, if you feel more comfortable to wear a mask, then you are certainly welcome to do so. We're going to take every precaution that we can to keep everyone safe. And you do what is right for your family to keep your family cared for. And uh, we just feel it's really important that we continue to gather and to meet, to worship together, and to learn from God's Word together and encourage each other. So we hope that you join us next Sunday uh, up at the Greenhouse. Watch the app, watch the website, watch the email, watch social media, whatever it else it is that you watch. And we'll have more details for you as that gets a little closer, okay? So let's take a moment and pray. Thank you again for your giving. The offering box is here. The app is there if you want to give that way. If you're not able to give, we certainly understand. We're just glad that you're here with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace in our lives in every way. We know that everything that we have, you've given us because you are a good God. Every good and perfect thing comes down from above, from James who calls you says that you are the father of lights. You are the one who causes the sun to rise in the morning, for the moon to reflect its light at night, for the stars to shine above us. You're the God of all of that. You're the God of this, this world, this state, this county, this town. And most definitely, you are the God of this church. We place all things in your hands. We trust you for what you will give us in the coming days. We ask your protection for our people. For our families, we ask that you would watch over them, keep them safe, and enable us to continue to do what you've called us to in this community. In Christ's name.
to come belongs to Christ and Christ to God. So here we stand, hands lifted high, the very hands and feet of Christ. No holding back, no wasting time. We live for love. here this morning. We're gathered in your name. We are grateful for the opportunity to be together here today. We just pray over the next few minutes that you will meet with us, that you will open our eyes and ears to the truth of your word, that we might learn from it, so that we might grow closer, that we might be more faithful, more consistent in our obedience, and that as a church we may increase the work that you have given us to do. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, folks. Have a seat. I realized afterwards, after I had come up here a minute ago and done the announcements for you, that I was also supposed to remind you that uh, if you are not able to join us at the greenhouse, or if you would rather not join us there and be a part of that, that the live stream will still be going on. You'll still be able to watch it that way. I believe we're still going to do the FM station, so if you want to drive in your car and Park outside the greenhouse so that you're adjacent to us and listen to it there. You can do that as well, uh, as well as watch the recording later on in the weekend as it's posted for you. So uh, you can take advantage of any of those that works best for your family uh, in the coming days. I was just thinking, doing a little reading, uh, reading an article online the other day about Brazilian fire ants. Now, uh, I've been to Brazil three times. I've been deep in the Amazon rainforest. Dave's been there probably 23 times, uh, and some others of you have been down there. And one thing that's amazing about the Amazon, the Amazon is its own whole huge ecosystem. And biologists tell us that there are literally thousands and thousands of species of plant and animal and insect and fish that are not found anywhere else in the entire world. They're only found in the Amazon River Basin, the Amazon rainforest. And one of those is called the Brazilian fire ant. And uh, I've never seen a Brazilian fire ant in my three trips to the jungle. I did see a tarantula once. It was about the size of my palm. It was the first service that we were there the first time I went to Brazil. And uh, I was terrified. And so I took a picture from 30 feet away so I could prove that it happened. And then I notified one of the Brazilian guys that was traveling with us that, you know, we needed to evacuate or shut the service down or something. And he went over and took an old cedar shingle that was laying on the floor, scooped it up, waggled it in front of my face, and chucked it out the window. What I neglected to bring up after he did that was that he chucked it right out onto the path that we would all be walking to get back to our hammocks later in the evening, but he seemed to think it was okay, so I said, okay, I guess we're all right. But anyway, Brazilian fire ants. Scientists have been baffled by them because they don't swim. If you take a Brazilian fire ant and you throw it in a bucket or in a tub or in a river, it will sink, it will die, it will drown. And yet, the Brazilians tell of masses of Brazilian fire ants that float in the river. 
See, what happens in the Amazon rainforest is sometimes you get flash floods. The river can rise and grow to two or three times its normal size very, very quickly. And what the Brazilian fire ants do, scientists have discovered, is that they, when that happens and they find themselves flung into the water by the force of the wind or the rain, is that they find each other, they, I was going to say doggy paddle, I don't know what they do, ant paddle or whatever, over to each other, and they interlock their legs and they form what scientists are calling now a superorganism. And in fact, masses of these fire ants have been found to float in the Amazon for months until they can reach dry land. Scientists have discovered that there's some kind of communal instinct, some kind of social instinct in these fire ants that causes them to know that it's either join or die. And when I was reading that article, I thought about us. I thought about us as a church and what God has called us to do in this community. That We need to be connected. That we need to be working together to do what God is asking us to do here in the Oxford Hills. You see, if you decide to go it alone in the raging storm of this life and this culture that is around us that we find ourselves in the middle of today, your odds of survival are low. It's not easy to be the lone person standing against a flood of cultural pressure to live a certain way, to do a certain thing, to nod and wink to things that you know are wrong. And your chances of being able to walk the line of godly, godliness are much lower. But if we band together, if we cling together, if we grow together, we can ride out the storm that we find ourselves in. Now last week we talked about taking personal responsibility for our spiritual lives and growth and that is so very important for each one of us as individuals to make that decision. However, we must understand that there is a communal aspect of being a Christ follower. We are not called to live as Christ followers alone. It's not a solo sport. It's a team sport. The word church is the word ekklesia. In the Greek language, the root that ecclesia comes from, it comes from a verb which means to call out of. And friends, God has called us out of this culture. He has called us out of this lifestyle that is so pervasive. There is also an implication here that we are not only called out of something, but we are called to something. We are called out of this world and to God's kingdom, to his family, to the church. Now, I was encouraged last week that three or four of you noticed that we weren't doing our whole story series. Did anybody else notice? Eight people. Eight people noticed we weren't in Job. I had somebody come up to Tim uh, last week and say, hey, what happened? I was reading in Job all week and you didn't. And uh, Steve Coombs, Steve, if you're out there watching today, uh, I was encouraged that Steve was paying attention because it was only halfway through the message that we realized that we weren't in Job, that we were in 2 Timothy. So I was supposed to tell you it was my mistake that we we're pausing the whole story series to do this today, yesterday, and or last week and today to do our partnership covenant. And then starting next week, we're going to be talking about our Rooted series and talk, kicking off our capital campaign. So you'll hear more about that last week. But this week we're in Jude. So if you have your Bible, turn all the way to the back and then flip back a few pages through Revelation to Jude because it's the second to the last book. It's only 25 verses and of those 25, Jude takes the first 16 and he warns us, just like Paul did in 2 Timothy 3 last week, he warns us about the heresy and the ungodliness of the last days. But what I want to look at with you this morning is the last seven verses, the last eight verses. 
I want you to notice that Jude not only warns us about this heresy, but he gives us a strategy of how we are to deal with it. What are we supposed to do? How do we go about this? What is our mission in this crazy world? And I want to suggest to you this morning that our mission is to strengthen each other and reach the lost. That's what God is asking us to do, to strengthen each other and reach the lost. So as always, we're going to read some scripture together and see what God is telling us and how it applies to us today. So if you're following along with me, first of all, we're going to see the reality of the world we live in in verses 17 to 19. Listen to what he says. You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. So we know that Paul warned us about this. We looked at that last week. John warns us about this. Peter warns us about this. Even Jesus himself, when he was walking this earth, he warned us that there would be people who would come into our lives who would try to sway us, who would try to impact us, who would spew heresy and try to confuse us and deceive people. And just like last week from 2 Timothy 3, this week in Jude, we see that these are the last days. These are the last days. Now, before you leave here and say, hey, Pastor Mike said Jesus was coming back next week, that's not what I'm saying. We don't know how long the last days are, but we know these are the last days. This is the last period of time to be determined in length by God himself. This is the last period of time in which God will deal mercifully with the people of this earth. He has chosen to give us the opportunity to trust Christ, to accept salvation, to live for him. One day soon, we don't know exactly when, when Christ returns and that window will close. And God will change his dealings with mankind and he will no longer be merciful. He will judge the world by his justice. We see that very clearly in the book of Revelation. And so Jude reminds us again that in these last days that we're living in, there will be those who will deceive. He calls them scoffers. The word literally here is mockers. It also carries with the idea of false teachers. These, by the way, can be found inside the church and outside the church. Unfortunately, there are those that call themselves believers, that call themselves Christians, that call themselves teachers who are sharing things widely that are not true. There are some who are telling us that we don't need the first two-thirds of the Bible, that the Old Testament is not necessary for us anymore. That's heresy, my friends. The Old and New Testaments both are God's word. We need the whole thing. God gave it to us to know and to learn from. Make no mistake about it, friends, even the philosophies that you are hearing on the news. Maybe you say, well, I'm, 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 not, I'm not listening to anyone else. I'm not listening to these false teachers from churches who are telling us things that are wrong about God and the Bible. But even the things that you are hearing on your radios, on your phones, your televisions, your computers, even those things, these philosophies being spewed out all around us, they are religions. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Humanism is a religion. Self-love is a religion. It's a belief system because it changes the very way you live your life. We're seeing that right now. These philosophies are religions. I want you to notice that Jude says one of the main goals of these people is to create division. They cause divisions. Literally, the word is distinctions. And again, you can see that happening all around us. What does God call us to do as the church, as his people? What does God call us to do? He calls us to, to gather. He calls us to unify. He calls us to, to set aside our differences, to care for each other, to encourage each other. We'll see that in just a moment. But these philosophies divide us and create distinctions, and that's the very opposite of what God's word tells us to do. 
What does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 4? He says, we have one Lord, one faith, one spirit. And we are called together in one body. I want you to notice that next Jude addresses the responsibility that we have to each other in verses 20 and 21. Here's verse 20. But you, beloved, building up yourselves or building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now here Jude does something that is so common. I've mentioned it to you before if you noticed it is that he puts a hinge in here, a shift. He says, this is what they're doing. This is what these false teachers are doing, those that would try and confuse you. But you, there's a shift. There's a hinge. Here's the strategy. Here's the difference. Here's God's calling to us as a church. Just like the Brazilian fire ants, we need each other. And he tells us four things that we should be doing. These four things should be prominent here at Mossbrook Church. These four things, here they are. Number one, build each other up. I won't bore you with Greek verb tenses and all that kind of stuff, but here's what you need to know about that command, build each other up. It is a command and it is ongoing. What, What Jude is saying here is build each other up today and keep on building each other up, and this is not optional. It needs to continually be happening. The only way to recognize error is to know the truth. When I turn on my radio in the car or I flick on my computer and I click on something to listen to and I hear somebody spewing these things, I know immediately that it's error. Why? Because I know the truth. Now, I don't know it perfectly. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is I am continually making an effort to learn and to know the truth and to encourage you to do the same. And that is the way that you will recognize error when you know the truth. We need to encourage each other in that. This command is all about the scripture and our knowledge of it. And this is why so many people are being deceived by what's happening because they don't know the truth. This is why we have small groups. This is why we encourage you to come to church. This is why I encourage you to be part of the small group. By the way, we've been looking at our small groups, and if you're interested, you can talk to Tim Yates or Jessica after or me or Tim, and we can help you, but we have more small group leaders ready to go than we ever have, and we have some small groups that are waiting for people (laughs) to be in them. So be a part of a small group. Build each other up. Learn and know the truth. When the Apostle Paul was talking to the other apostles and encouraging and challenging them in Acts chapter 20, he said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, to strengthen you and help you to know the truth. So build each other up. Here's the second thing that we need to be doing to strengthen each other. We need to pray together in the Holy Spirit. This means that we need to be praying in agreement with his will, in agreement with his desires. Again, we need to know the word because that's where God's will is revealed, and we need to pray it. There's so many times when we look around and we say, I don't know what I should do. But God reveals his will to us in his word. We won't know it unless we know the word. When we know it, we need to pray it. We need to pray that God will, through his Holy Spirit, give us the strength to bring our lives into line with it. We need to ask him for his power and his working and for our unity as we move forward. Pray together in the Holy Spirit. That's the second one. Here's the third one. We need to be watching over each other. Jude says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, I want you to notice something about this. He doesn't say, keep yourself in the love of God. Now, you don't need to know Greek grammar to understand this, just English grammar. How many passionate fans of English grammar are in the crowd here today? Actually, I'm kind of impressed. There's like 10 of us. That's, that's cool. I thought there would be two, me and some other nerd. But... Uh, English grammar is all you need here, folks. If Jude had said, keep yourself in the love of God, what would he be saying? He'd be saying, you need to do it for yourself, singular. That's where the grammar part comes in. What does he say? He says, keep yourselves, 
keep yourselves in the love of God. That means I don't just work at taking care of myself and guarding myself and watching over myself. That's what the word keep means. It means to guard. It means to protect. It means I have to do it for you. And you do it for me. Watch over each other. Look after each other. It takes constant care to ensure that our minds are pure, that our words are healing rather than hurting, that our motives are honoring to God. And we need each other's encouragement and challenge in this. Again, our small groups, that's why we do this, folks. Because we need to be encouraged. I need people. There are times when I am discouraged. There are times when my mind drifts. And I need to be reminded, reminded of what is true and what is right. And so do you. We all do. Over in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says it this way. He says, being alone is incredibly difficult. Two is better and three is best. It's difficult to stand alone on the top of a hill and fight off the enemies coming up in 360 degrees. But if you have someone that you can stand back to back with, you can defend both directions. And three is even better. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 4. The same is true with us spiritually. To be consistent in our obedience, we need to watch over each other. And here's number four. We need to anticipate Christ's return. He says, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word waiting here carries with it the idea of expectancy. It means active looking. Have you ever seen a little kid that's waiting for his dad to come home for work or waiting for his mom to come home from work? And when he knows it's time, he keeps running over to the window and peeking outside to see if he's there. That's the idea. The other day I drove home and I pulled in the yard and there was Gavin standing there at the window waiting for me to get in. No, he wasn't doing that. He used to do that, but he doesn't do it anymore. That's what, that's what Jude is talking about here. It's that expectancy. It's that active waiting and looking. Is he coming? Is he coming? The anticipation of Christ's return should color every area of our lives. Are you looking for Christ's return today? If you're not, you should be. Because it could happen. I was talking to someone the other day and they said, man, I don't know when this is all going to end. I wish Christ would come back. And I said, it could happen today. And they said, like they'd never thought of it before. It could happen today. We may never make it to the greenhouse. Christ could return. I'm excited by that. I'm ready. Are you ready? Do you live that way? Does it color everything that you do? Are you terrified of what's out there? Or are you thinking, if Christ comes back, all of these worries on earth are over. That's how Jude says we should be living. Now I want you to notice in these last couple of verses the charge that we have toward others. In verses 22 and 23, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now we've just talked about four things that we need to do together. We're together. We're like the Brazilian fire ants. We've got our legs, you know, we're all interlocked so we can ride out the storm. And that is part of our mission but the church cannot only turn inward we can't only focus in we have a responsibility to the world that's around us as well we have a mandate that involves the world three things very quickly number one jude says be compassionate toward the unsure he says be merciful to those who doubt the word doubt means vacillating it means back and forth it means it carries with the idea of, of being confused there's many people around us that, that just aren't sure what they believe. They're confused by what's going on. They don't know what's right or what's wrong. What should I do? What shouldn't I do? And Jude says we need to show kindness to these people. We need to be compassionate with them. We need to share the truth gently with them. 
that they may know of God's love. We're not to ignore their sin, but we are to be patient and gentle so that they would understand the gospel before it's too late. Because when Christ comes back, as I said before, his dealings with this world are going to change. Secondly, be compassionate toward the unsure. That's number one. Secondly, we are to seek to rescue the convinced. There's a lot of people out there that are confused. They don't know what to do. Should I do this? Shouldn't I? Should I do that? You know, uh, who do I listen to? They're confused. With some, the challenge is more difficult because they're not confused. They know what they believe, and they believe the lies. They don't believe the truth of God's word. They aren't confused. They're convinced that the gospel is wrong. They're convinced that God is not real or that he does not care about them or love them or can help them. And Jude says with them, we don't need to just show mercy. They need to be rescued. The idea here is a little bit different. It's a little bit more active. It's a little bit more decisive in action. It's like the lifeguard who is aware that there's a strong undertow. And to some people, all he has to do on the beach is go up and say, you know, folks, the undertow is really strong today. You probably better not go in. And they say, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Now that I know the truth, I won't go swimming. But there's another group that just goes out anyway, and the lifeguard just has to swim out and try to rescue them. That's what Jude's talking about. There's the confused that don't know the truth, but there are others who are convinced of it, and they're all in. And that's the word that Jude uses when he says, snatch. Snatch them out of the fire. They need to be saved. They need to know the truth. Now, we know that salvation is God's work, but we are charged with being involved in people's lives. Those who do not know the truth, who are convinced of error, he says, snatch them out of the fire. What's he talking about? Is Jude just trying to be dramatic? No, he's not being dramatic. He's being right up front. The fire there refers to hell which is the destiny of all who die without Christ. Friends, we don't talk about it very much, but the Bible is very clear that all who die without Christ will spend eternity in hell. This is part of our mandate. Be compassionate toward the unsure. Seek to rescue the convinced. And here's the third one. Carefully interact with those who lead others astray. Notice what he says. To others show mercy with fear hating even the garment stained by the flesh. This is the group that's confused, and there's the group that's convinced of the lies, and then there's the group that leads those who are convinced by the lies. These are actively promoting error. They're actively deceiving people, and they're characterized by a sinful, heretical lifestyle in church and choices. They're firmly against God. They're firmly against the Scripture. They're firmly against the church. But guess what they need? They need Christ. They need salvation. They need the gospel. And Jude says we have a responsibility to them, too. Those who are leading the charge in the other direction. They also need Christ, but Jude says we need to do it with fear, with an awareness that we too can get caught in the lies. We need to be careful. That's why it's so important that we know what we believe, because those things can defile us too. So we need to take care. But the bottom line is, folks, that everyone needs the truth. And this is very, very serious, that we understand as a church that our mission is to strengthen each other and reach the lost. And this mission is going to get more and more important, and it's going to get more and more difficult as time passes. I don't know if you noticed this over the last few months, but things don't appear to be getting easier, and they may not. I was with you guys. I was with the majority. The first three or four months this was going on, I was the guy walking around saying, man, 
I can't wait for things to get back to normal, right? You know what I've been thinking the last two months? What if it doesn't? What if this is it? What if things never go back to the way they are? Show me the passage of Scripture where God promises us that things will always go back to normal after difficult times. It's not there, friends. It's not there. This is why we are here. What if normal doesn't come back? I'm not trying to scare anybody. I hope normal does come back. I'm normal, relatively. And I want normal. I love normal. I crave it. But what if it doesn't come back? This is why we're here. If you have ever wondered, why didn't God just save us and take us to heaven? I hope you've been listening the last 25 minutes. Because this is why. Let me give you three action steps as we close here this morning. Here's the first one. Prepare yourself for what is happening and for what's coming. Get yourself into the Word. Learn the truth because it is your only defense against everything that's happening. It's your only defense from error. Here's the second action step. The first one is prepare yourself for what's happening. Here's the second one. Determine who God wants you to pull out of the fire. If you're here this morning and you're a Christ follower, then God has someone in mind for you to reach out to. I know that for a fact. That's what he's called us to do. Is there a friend, a co-worker, a family member, somebody who fits in one of these categories, somebody who is confused, or maybe somebody who is convinced, or maybe somebody who is out there leading the charge in the other direction? He wants you to reach out to them. And here's the third action step. Number one, prepare yourself for what's coming. Number two, determine who God wants you to pull out of the fire. And number three, join us as we do this together. I think there's a storm. If it's not already here, it's coming. And I would like for as many people as possible to join together with us so that we can ride this out together. And that's why this morning we had them pass out the partnership covenant sheets. If you haven't had time to look it over, then obviously we're not forcing you to do anything that you're not comfortable with. But if you want to be a part of what's going on here as a church, then we'd encourage you to join us in what we're doing. Ask God what he is asking of you and then come together with us and do that. I'm going to ask the band to come if they would. They're going to lead us in a song. If you have that covenant and you want to fill it out this morning, then you can bring it up while the song is playing. You can put it in that basket or you can pull out your phone and fill it out online on the app or the website, whatever you would like to do. If you're not, if you want to take it home and pray about it and think about it and bring it back, you can do that too. But we pray that you will join us because God has sent us out. We're here together, and now we're going out to do what God has called us to do. You'll stand and sing with us a final song today.
Some days when I'm just a touch overwhelmed by all that needs to happen in this world <laughs> and everything that there is to stand against. So we talk about these things for 25 minutes, a half an hour, and then we get to the end and we say, how can we possibly do this? Well, I haven't read you the two best verses of the whole passage. They're the last ones. This is how Jude finishes that challenge. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless in the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. The only way any of this is possible is because we serve Almighty God. And all the lies and all the deception and all the heresy and all the evil that's in this world is no match for the all-powerful God. That's why Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. So how do we do this? <laughs> we don't. God does, and we go with him. 
together we go with him. Mossbrook, let's stay together. Let's be strong together in the strength and power of the Almighty God who created the heaven and the earth. He created it. He will use it. He will judge it. In the end of time, he will make a new heaven and earth and we'll dwell with him for eternity. That's the promise. So we keep going. Father, thank you so much for this challenge to our hearts and this encouragement that you are the one who has all power, all dominion, all glory, not only now but for all of eternity. Encourage our discouraged hearts. Strengthen our weak spirits. And challenge us, Lord, to move forward together. May we lock arms and move forward and out into this community as you have called us. I pray that we would encourage each other, build each other up, pray together in the Holy Spirit, that we would keep watch over each other, and that we would anticipate your return so that we can encourage the confused and seek out those who are convinced and even challenge those who lead the charge in the other direction, Father. To you be all glory. Thank you for this place. We know you have said that if no one would praise you, that the rocks and the trees would cry out. Well, that's not going to happen here in the Oxford Hills because we are going to continue to praise and worship your name until the day when Christ returns. Give us strength, Father. Help us to be faithful. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, folks. I hope that you have a great week.